OK, so now you know everything there is to know about quantum computation. Great. And now I'll tell you uh, how Grover's algorithm works, which is this algorithm, which, uh, as I said before, I think a good way to think about it is it solves the SAT problem in something like square root 2 to the power of n time. OK, so this is SAT in uh, about well, O twiddle root 2 to the n time. OK, so uh, really I mean like the circuit sat problem. So here the input is a Boolean circuit, a classical Boolean circuit, uh, C. And normally the goal, let's say, oh, n inputs, one output. OK, then what is the normal goal in circuit sat? You give it a circuit, you want to decide yes or no, is there some input string that makes the circuit output 1? That's the task. And generally also, when the answer is yes, you would like to find such a string that makes it output 1. Or correctly output that uh, the answer is there's no such string. Let me make a few simplifications here. Really, if you're like into complexity theory, there's like two parameters to worry about, the number of inputs n to the circuit, and also the number of gates in the circuit itself. But let's just assume that C has like, it's not a big deal, it's just a, so we only have like one parameter. Assume C has like poly n gates, which is the reasonable case. Okay, and then we could just have one parameter n, okay? And in this case, we still believe that solving the SAT problem should take 2 to the n time. Like, we don't really know much better algorithm than just enumerate all the 2 to the n strings, plug them into C. You can evaluate C on a given string in, like, poly n time. So that's considered no problem. Uh, and see if any of them output 1. Uh, I'm also going to make one simplifying assumption, which is not necessary for Grover's algorithm, but I'm just making it because, you know, we only have, um, whatever, 21 minutes left in this lecture. So uh, let's assume that um, either C of x is 1 on a unique string, which I'll call x star, or it's always output 0. OK, so technically this makes the problem easier, because I'm promising you either, like, either there's exactly one string that makes C output 1, or they all output 0. But like intuitively, this is like the hardest case, like when there's just one string that makes it output 1, and like you've got to worry about that possibility. And indeed, in some sense, this is uh, really the hardest case. You can reduce the general case to this case, at least with some randomization. OK, but this will make the presentation of Grover's algorithm simpler. So far, so good? So now let me. Now that we've made those assumptions, this assumption mainly, let me say another thing that we can say. Without loss of generality, we may as well focus on the task where we assume it's this case, where there is a unique x star, and our goal is to find that x star. And we don't have to worry about what the algorithm does when there is no x star, because let's say I come up with a you know, great algorithm that runs in a certain amount of time with the property that it can always find the x star that makes c output 1, provided that x star exists. OK, so in the case where it does exist, great, the algorithm you know, finds it as desired. What happens in the case where it doesn't exist? Well, we don't know anything in principle, but like the algorithm definitely cannot find a string that makes c output 1, because there is no such string. So if the algorithm like, fails to find such a string, we can just say, oh, we must have been in this case when there are no such strings. OK, so I'm relying on the property here that like, an algorithm can check a potential candidate. Like once it's run, it's like if any string is going to make C output one, it's this x star, it's this x. You know, it can then, as like a final step, plug that into C and see if indeed that makes it output one. Okay, so all of which is to finally say um, for this Grover problem, what we're going to focus on is. Uh, uh, finding this x star, assuming it exists.
Okay, so finally, the problem boils down to, I give you a Boolean circuit with n inputs, like think of n as a thousand in your head, one output, and I promise you there's exactly one string from among the two to the a thousand's input possibilities that makes this circuit output one. Like, please find it. Of course, there's the brute force algorithm of just try all strings until you hit this x star. That takes time like two to the n times poly n. Okay, and Grover's going to do it in root two to the n times poly n time. Okay, any question about that? There's one more thing. Let me say we're going to find it uh, with high probability. Because it's a, you know, quantum algorithms are sort of inherently probabilistic. In fact, we're not even going to find it with high probability. We'll find it with not low probability. So like, I don't know, probability at least 1%. And this is also fine, because if you have an algorithm that finds x star with probability at least 1%, then you can just like run it 100 times, or like 500 times. And for every string it potentially outputs, you can check whether that's indeed the string that makes the output 1. And if it is, great. If it's not, you're like, well, I'm going to run this 499 more times. Okay, and therefore, this is good enough to you because by running it like a constant number of, here I really mean a constant, like 1%. By running it like 100 times or 200 times, you can raise this 1% up to a really high probability. Okay, great. So now we're set up to actually do Grover. And uh, I will tell you Grover's uh, algorithm. So, yeah, let's do it over here. Okay, so uh, the algorithm has a few preliminary steps. Okay, so preliminary step one, we like, you know, allocate n qubits or get our n photons together. Okay, and we initialize them to states, as I said before, uh, well, this trivial state that has like, one zero 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 zero. Okay. And the next sort of preliminary step is like bam, we do this uh, Hadamard transformation right away. Okay, and if you remember, what does this Hadamard matrix look like? Hopefully you remember from last time. Uh, the first column is all plus ones. And it has some other entries. But I bring this up because, well, we know what the new state will be when you multiply this matrix against this vector. It'll just turn into this column. Okay, so the new state is now the amplitudes are all plus 1 over root n. Okay, so you can think of them as they're represented by the function f of x equals plus 1 over root n for all x. Okay, we have like an equal superposition of all the two to the little n uh, positions in the vector. And the last uh, preliminary thing is to uh, build the quantification, quantumification of the input circuit C. Okay, so take the circuit C and this, do this thing that I'm telling you about on the top board, which is build the quantum version of it. Okay, this takes like poly n little n time, and it's a poly n size, little n size circuit, so this part is efficient. Remember, we're shooting for an algorithm that's like time 1.4 to the n, so poly n is perfectly fine. And remember, what does this QC quantum circuit do to states? Well, we're, remember, we're now assuming C outputs zero on all but one string, x star, where it outputs one. So this matrix here is going to have like all ones on the diagonal except for one negative one uh, in the x star position. So what does this quantum circuit do? It, its whole thing that it does is it negates a single amplitude of the state. Which amplitude? The one in the x star position. Which bear in mind the algorithm does not know. But like it has, now it has this like mystery box it can do to the state. And the only thing it knows is that will negate the x star amplitude. I mean, f of x star. So for example, uh, if you know, little n is 2 and capital N is uh, therefore 4, 
And therefore, the plot of f initially looks like this. You know, there's four values, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. OK, initially after step two, the amplitudes look like a quarter, a quarter. This is some kind of histogram. A quarter, a quarter. No. Uh, half, 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 half. OK, this is height half. OK, and the algorithm like knows that the amplitudes look like this. Half, 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 half. Uh, and then it can apply this QC, and that will like negate one of the amplitudes. Perhaps if this is x star. It'll turn this to like minus a half. Okay? The algorithm doesn't know this was x star. The algorithm knows that the pattern looks something like this, but it doesn't know which one's minus. Okay? Now here's one thing the algorithm should not do. The algorithm should not now say, all right, I'm going to measure the state. Because if you measure the state now, all of the f hat square or the f squareds are all a quarter. It doesn't matter that you minus this one. They're all a quarter. So you would just get back each of the two-bit strings with equal probability, and it would be useless. You did not learn any information about which one was x star. Okay, but that's okay. This is just the preliminaries. So now here comes the exciting bit. So Grover thought up a clever sequence of like three moves that will. Uh, Greatly improve this situation. And here they are. I'll call them collectively like the Grover move. Step one, take your state and apply this Boolean Fourier transform to it. 1 over root n, h n. Okay. Step two, apply the quantum quantumification of the OR function of this of a circuit that computes the OR of n bits. Okay, that's an extremely simple circuit, the OR circuit. It has like n classical gates, so you can quantumify it and get like an order n gate uh, quantum circuit which also does like a very simple thing, as I'll mention in a second. Uh, well, let me just mention it now. I mean, by looking at this, right, this is the matrix that uh, has a 1 here and negative 1 everywhere else. OK, so this is the matrix which negates all the amplitudes except for the zeroth amplitude. And 3. Apply this Hadamard transformation again. OK, these three moves, which are all collectively efficient, is like the Grover move. And we're going to analyze what it does to like pictures that look like this. One quick thing I'll say is like uh, these are all linear transformations. So like it's equivalent if I move this one of our root n down here. And I do this because this is kind of like the Boolean Fourier transform. This is kind of like the inverse Boolean transform. So what do these three moves collectively do? You have some that when you apply them to a vector of uh, amplitudes, think of what happens if you apply these to a vector of amplitudes. In some sense, like what does this step do? It transforms this vector of like the function's values, the truth table of a function, to the coefficients representation. It transforms it to the coefficients of the multilinear polynomial representation of f. So one kind of gives you the vector f hat empty set f hat one you know f hat n. Where, like we talked about last time, these coefficients are the coefficients of writing f as a polynomial. I guess I should reuse this notation for the monomial.
OK? And what does 2 do? I just told you. It negates all the entries except for the first one. So it basically takes this polynomial, this multilayer polynomial, and negates all the coefficients except the, the zeroth one, which is the, like the empty set coefficient, the constant coefficient. So if you think of f as like a multilinear polynomial, 2 you know, negates all coefficients except for the constant coefficient. And what is the constant coefficient? If you remember from last time, this is the expected value of f, the average value. Uh, okay, so in other words, this 2, uh, f of x now sort of after it becomes the original constant coefficient minus all the other terms. Uh, let me write this expectation as mu, or this average as mu. This is um, mu minus f of x minus mu. Right? I like took away the constant coefficient mu, negated it, and then I added the constant coefficient back in. So like 2 changes the coefficients of the polynomial in this way, and then 3 just like puts it back to the truth tables. Okay? So the overall effect of uh, Grover's move This vector of values f, uh, f's values are flipped across their average. Right, this says, like, look at all the, for what's the new value of f of x? Look at how much the old, old value differed from the average of all the old values, and then uh, go the opposite direction from the average. Okay? So if you think about it for one second, maybe this is going a little bit fast, but um, for a collection of numbers, to transform them in this way is to like, reflect all of them across their average. Okay? So this is the overall effect of the Grover move. So in particular, like, let's go back to this little example. If I were in this position and I did the Grover move, what would the new four values be? Well, the values are half, 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 and minus a half, the average of which is a quarter, right? Which is here. That's mu, a quarter. And like, think of it like a mirror, OK? So afterwards, you reflect all of them through the average. So like, this goes down to 0. This goes down to 0. This goes up. Uh, this distance is a half, 3 quarters. So you have to go 3 quarters above here, which actually is to 1. And then this one goes to 0. OK, so actually, after one Grover move, the new amplitudes are 0, 0, 1, 0. Ah, oh, ta-da. Now if I measured, I would get x star with 100% probability, which is great. Now that's the case, little n equals 2, but it's going to be pretty good in the general case. So uh, we're almost done. Let me just sketch the general case uh, of this. OK, so in general, how does it go? Uh, OK, so this is some kind of weird plot where the uh, x-axis is the Boolean strings, like, you know, 0 to the n, 0, and then 1, and then all the way to 1 to the n. There's like some x star out here, which we don't know. And the initial amplitudes are all 1 over root n. 
Uh, well, this one's actually minus 1 over root n. OK, so we want to find out what happens with one Grover move. Well, first we have to say, what is the average of these amplitudes? The average is basically 1 over root n. OK, this is like kind of negligible. The average is going to be like super close, maybe just a tiny bit less than 1 over root n. OK, so when we now do the Grover move, these numbers all get reflected across the average. So basically, all the non-x star ones barely change. But this one, it's like distance 2 over a root n away. So it becomes distance 2 over root n the way this way. So it becomes 3 over root n. OK. Now we do QC again. What does QC, again, does QC do? It negates the x star amplitude, which we don't know which it is, but it just does. So we do QC again. And this becomes minus 3 over root n. Okay, this is going to be a little animation on the board here. Now we do Grover again. What's the new average? The new average is still basically 1 over root n. So when we do the Grover move, all these other amplitudes basically don't change. And this one is now 4 over root n away. So it shoots up to 5 over root n. Okay. And now we do QC again. It goes down to minus 5 over root n. We do Grover again. It goes up to 7 over root n. Okay, so after repeated Grovering, you know, f of x star becomes like 3 over root n, 5 over root n, 7 over root n, 9 over root n, etc. Okay, basically, because the average is not literally exactly 1 over root n, but the average remains like 1 over root n even once this gets as large as like 0.1. And once this gets as large as 0.1, then we are in good shape. We measure, and we receive x star with probability 0.1 squared, which is 1%, which is our goal. And how many times do we have to do this to get it up to 0.1? Well, something like root n divided by 0.1 times, maybe divided by 2. So therefore, after like order root n, which is order root 2 to the little n, which is the same as root 2 to the n, funnily enough. It's like x percent of y is the same as one, y percent of x. You know that little funny trick? It's like square root of a to the b is the same as square root of a to the b. Anyway, uh, yeah, after this many steps, you know, the amplitude gets up to a constant. We measure, and we learn x star with like 1% chance. 